Well, friends, this discipleship thing is tough sometimes. You know, I told you earlier about the loss of uh, Dr. Abraham and uh, uh, that that loss will fe be felt across uh, 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 the Christianity in a lot of ways because he had uh, uh, he helped start denominations over in Thailand and Tibet and other places and uh, that were not Methodist but they were Christian and then even among our group we have friends people we've spent many many years with who we have learned have loss and because we're disciples we yearn to reach out and be the body of Christ to different people because we but because we become maybe estranged for one reason or another, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but our heart for discipleship aches for the other people. And sometimes our heart for discipleship leads us to question things about ourselves. and Jesus, I want to be a better disciple, but sometimes I don't know what to do. And sometimes I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. And I don't. And then I feel bad about it. On well, today's reading, we're going to hear uh, the, what's been called the second most well-known parable in the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The most common one is the prodigal son. Everybody, that's the most popular one. Everybody knows that one. The second one is the rich young ruler. Now, just for the record, he's not rich, young, and a ruler in all three. In Matthew, he's the young man. In Mark, he's the ruler. I mean, in Luke, he's the ruler. And in Mark, he's rich. So the parable of the rich young ruler is a summary of all three synoptic gospels. So that's how we get to rich young ruler. No one gospel tells it exactly the same way. But today we're in Mark, so Mark, he's going to be a rich guy. Now, for many years, this has been preached as a, 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 either something to make rich people feel guilty or something. Uh, um, and that's really not what it's about. Jesus isn't talking about the money per se. He's talking about the hearts. So I want you to remember that this is right after the, he was tried to be tricked by the Pharisees on the divorce question, and he flipped it back around to a heart issue. You remember? And he ended it with children. He, children came to him. The disciples were saying, don't do that. Don't bother Jesus with the kids. And Jesus got indignant. He says, whoa, don't get in the way of them coming to me. If you don't come to the kingdom like a child with childlike faith, then... You're going to miss it. You're not going to get it all. So Jesus had just said that. When we get into the part we're going to read today in Mark uh, chapter 10, we're going to pick up in verse 17, and we're going to read through uh, the end of the chapter, or through 31. I guess that's the end of the chapter. No, not quite. So um, let's pick up in verse 17 right after he spoke about the children. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony and do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, 
eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. You know, there's actually a whole lot in that. There's a lot in that. But what I want to say here is that, first of all, this is not about the man's money. Because just like last week where Jesus flipped it back to a heart issue, that's what he's doing again here. He's talking about the man's heart. Because he said he loved him. That means he was looking at the man's heart. He wasn't paying attention to what all he did. I mean, he rattled off the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth commandments and then threw in a defraud just for good measure. And the young man said, I've done all that since I was a little guy. I've been following God's rules, the Ten Commandments. I've been doing all that. And Jesus could see his heart, and he loved him. But he knew there was one thing that the man had that was in the way between him and God. And that was the, the, what Jesus asked him to give up. Because see, Jesus knew something about this guy and his wealth. The guy was attached to his wealth. And what I mean, what I mean by attached to it, part of it was his identity. He identified with who he was as that wealthy person. But beyond that, he was trapped by his wealth. And that was borne out by when Jesus says, give it all up. Follow me. And he couldn't do it. And so the lesson for us in this is there's something that we're connected to. Each of us has our own thing. Everybody's different. But we're hooked on to something that Jesus wants to free us from. Because here's the thing. This man ran up to Jesus. Remember this. Remember this. The man came to Jesus. He was seeking something. Okay? He wasn't just somebody just standing on the side of the street and just says, hey, you know what? I can do something for you. No, this guy came to Jesus. He wanted something done. And what he wanted was eternal life. He specifically asked, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He wanted something so somewhere inside, he thought or felt or assumed or feared that there was something about his life that was going to prevent him from inher inheriting eternal life. So he asked Jesus, what do I have to do to get it? Did y'all hear that? What do I have to do to get eternal life? And that was a clue for Jesus, and it's a clue for us, too. Because somehow this guy was thinking there's something he had to do. It was on him. And the author of life and the creator of the world gives eternal life freely and with grace. There's nothing we had to do to get it, but this man, who apparently through his wealth and connections and position or whatever thought there was something he had to do to get it. And so for Jesus, the clue in that was this man was trapped in something. Something was making him think he couldn't get it. And Jesus recognized what it was. So he told him to give that up. Because that's trapping you. It's keeping you from having that full experience, that full relationship, that full engagement with God. But everybody has something now. We all do. For this guy and this story, it's about his wealth. And it wasn't just the money. It wasn't the money. It was his attachment to it. It was his feeling like, I have this and this is my identity. But what do I got to do to get eternal? Do I write a check? Do I need to start a ministry? Do I need to build a new synagogue? Do I need to donate a field to the poor? What do I need to do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, just sell all you own and give it to the poor and come follow me. Let go of what it is that's holding, that you're holding on to that's preventing you from being able 
to reach God. There's something that's doing that. Something. And Jesus saw right straight to his heart. Now, he loved him. Because he saw the guy had a long record of good intentions of trying. Especially trying. Because the guy was cognizant of what he'd been doing, right? I mean, so he's doing some things with intentionality. Don't we all do that? We do ministry work. We do service work. We go to studies. We go to accountabilities. We do all kinds of stuff with intentionality to improve ourselves and to improve our understanding of our relationship with God and our relationship in the kingdom to be better disciples. So did this rich young ruler. But he specifically asked Jesus, how do I get in to heaven? What do I got to do to inherit the kingdom of God? I want it all. I want that full-on relationship with God forever. That's kind of the question he asked. And Jesus says, give up the thing that's got you trapped. And we don't want to miss this part, folks. Jesus' intent. It wasn't to make the man give up his money for the poor people. Jesus' intent was to set the man free. To set him free from his earthly burden that was keeping him from a full walk in relationship with God. In his case, it just happened to be money. But for each of us, it could be something completely different. Because see, that's what Jesus wants to do. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship has a cost. And the cost is we've got to give up the thing that's got us trapped that Jesus wants us to give up so we can be free. Free to worship Jesus. Free to follow God with our whole heart. That's what it is. So see, this isn't about a rich young ruler giving up all his money and then being sad because he can't do it. This is about Jesus trying to set him free. You know, all of us have our, our, our identity issues. We know the world out there is filled with a lot of mixed up people. They have identity crises. Some can't figure out what gender they're born with. Some can't figure out what the relationships are supposed to be like. Some people can't figure out the difference between being, making an honest living and being a crook. Some people can't figure out what it is they're supposed to do to be right with God. And so they just bring all this baggage. And then when Jesus tells them, just let that go. Oh, but I can't. That's who I am. Or that's who I think I am. Or that's who I've come to believe I am. Or you don't know how long I've been this way. Oh, yes, He does. Trust me, God knows how long you've been that way. Because He's been watching you get farther and farther and farther away. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what's in the way. And see, where we get in trouble in our discipleship is when God's knocking on our heart and He's speaking to us through the Word. Maybe He speaks to you through a sermon or through one of the readings or maybe through a praise song. When Freddie's singing to us. Maybe he's speaking to you through a conversation with a friend. Maybe he's speaking to you through a Christian movie or something. God can choose any medium to reach us that he thinks will reach us. But understand intent here. Just like Jesus' intent with this young man was to get him to let go of what it was that was holding him back because Jesus wanted to make him free. He wants to make us free. And the cost for our discipleship is us willing to let go of something that we're probably clinging to for dear life. And that was what made the man sad. Now, there's two ways to take this sadness when he was walking away, by the way. We don't have any completion of the story where the man actually did or didn't do this, do we? we most of the time through the years, we just assumed that when he walked away, he walked away sad and never did anything. But how about if he was sad because he, was, he realized that since he wanted eternal life, and he'd been following God with intentionality all these years, right? What if the reason why he was sad is because he realized he was about to go get rid of everything that he had to do what Jesus said to follow him? Because we don't have a name. We don't know who he was. We don't know that he didn't sell everything and follow Jesus. 
So he could have been sad because he knew he was walking away. And so why might we think that? Well, because of what Jesus says next. When he's explaining it to the disciples, because they said, well, we left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, and I tell you the truth, anyone who has, he's already done it. Jesus didn't say, anyone who will leave father, mother, children, farm. He said, anyone who has. That's past tense. It means they've already done it. Could he have been speaking about the young man? We don't know. But we should acknowledge that if we follow Jesus, there might be a cost for us as well that maybe we get estranged from parents or siblings or children or co-workers, neighbors. Maybe we have to leave our farm and move to the city. Maybe we have to leave the city and move to a farm. I don't know. Maybe it involves a geographic move. But Jesus said, anyone who leaves these type of things, relationships, for the purpose of following Jesus, will pick up more than we give up. I mean, he uses the phrase a hundredfold. And I can tell you from my firsthand experience, my personal experience, when I was back in the days when I used to live the way I used to live, I had maybe a dozen friends, drinking buddies, partying friends. We'd hang out together, drink a few beers, watch some football, drink a lot of beers and do stuff we weren't supposed to do. But when I changed my life and changed some things and got sober and started following Jesus, they were all gone. They ran for the hills, man. They didn't want nothing to do with me anymore. But truthfully, I didn't really want anything to do with them either. But in its place, over time, God didn't just restore that. One day when I was up at First Church in Coral Springs, I went to a, some friend's anniversary up there. And they had the, the, the youth center was about this big inside. And it was packed with people. And I knew every person there by the first name. And they knew me. And I thought, wow. What a transition. You know, from... 10, 12 years ago, just running around with a dozen drunks. To now, I've got a room with three or 400 people that I know are friends. I can call up any one of them at any time. Say, can you give me a hand with such and such? Or can I pray for you? Or whatever. I could call them. They could call me. What a transition. That's what the body of Christ is. That's what it does. So Jesus says, yeah, you're going to give us some stuff to be free, to have that relationship with God, to be able to you get to your eternal life, yeah. But that eternal life thing is not doesn't start when you die. It starts now. Now in this life. We can start reaping the benefits here and now. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to live into our eternal life now? I don't know if y'all think about that very often, if at all. But the truth of the matter is, we have been saved. It's already happened. Jesus already did for us what He's going to do and did. All we have to do now is live into it. Let go of whatever it is that's got us trapped. And Jesus is showing us. You all know He's shown you. Because that's the cost for our discipleship. Now, last words about this camel and I have a needle thing. Now, the Jesus I know and love has a pretty awesome sense of humor. Because people would have thought a little needle, even if they had a big bone needle or something, there was never a camel small enough to go through it. But when my son was in middle school, we were over at some friend's house, and uh, I was talking with his dad. He and I were having a conversation about this. We were kind of joking around. And his son said, well, the only problem was the needle wasn't big enough. Because in our modern way of thinking, well, you know, I'm thinking about a, I don't know, 112-foot needle would have a big enough eye for a camel to fit through. But see, Jesus was talking about the reality of a little bitty needle, a little bitty hole. If we're hanging on to something that's so big and so material-oriented, 
that makes us the size of a camel we can't fit through. But Jesus says, it may not be possible with man, but with God, all things are possible. And remember, friends, God is spirit. How much spirit do you think will fit through the eye of a needle? I'm thinking all of it. Zip right through. If it even had to go through the eye of a needle. So the cost of our discipleship is something that Jesus is knocking on our hearts, asking us to let go. And we all got something, or we have several things. So this week, have that conversation with God in your closet, your quiet space, your prayer time. Okay, God, I know you want me to get rid of this. You've been asking for a while. I haven't been listening, but I think I'm about ready. What do we have to do with this? Give me the courage, the fortitude, the clarity, and the willingness to walk through that eye and get where you want me to go. Because with God, all things are possible. And we can pay that cost. We can pay that price. Jesus paid a bigger price. He just wants us to be free. Free from this world and the trappings. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.